I love you. Hello everyone and welcome to our new sustainable funding vlogcast series uh, for storytellers, educators and educational technologists all made possible thanks to the generous support of BCIT and the love and cuddles of Mr. Linus here. So this in this interview series we're going to be interviewing creators from all around the world on how they're funding their creative endeavors and uh, with that we're going to be looking towards how they're creating sustainable solutions around their creative endeavors so uh so far in this series we've been filming it because we're filming with filming people all around the world we've been filming um it via skype and sort of uh, where we're using split screen video. If you have a suggestion for how to film it to capture better video quality while still at the same time keeping ease of filming for our subjects, our interviewees, that would be really fabulous. Um, just drop your suggestions down in the comments below. In this first episode of the series, we meet with one of the founders of Elementary, Nicole Kahn a woman of the world and jack of all trades. Since we interviewed Nicole in 2019, elementary has been growing, evolving, and they've had a few big wins, like being listed as one of the American School Library Association's best websites of 2019. So watch for notes throughout the broadcast with updates and highlights of what elementary is up to now. The thing is like, with digital, you have so much more opportunities. You can really affect not just, you know, your 100 students in front of you, but like it can be a tool to really impact uh, students all over the world, thousands, like, and make them actually like writing maybe and make them actually like doing things that are not just, you know, watching Netflix or uh, being passive because the the end goal is to really engage students to be active in their learning and not to just watch a video, fill out a, you know, a quiz with a multiple choice and then submitting it and saying, oh, I learned something. Our, our end goal is to really have students become participants into um, a more this connected world that we have and feel like they're, you know, being part of a community because when you create a story, you publish a story, all of a sudden your story is not your story. Your story is accumulation of maybe 10 artists, five musicians, and you're like the director of the entire project. And uh, being part of that is like what we really want to focus on. Nicole Kong. Uh, I was originally from the U U.S. Life has kind of taken me around the world <laughs> after I graduated. Uh, so I graduated from MIT. My background is actually in management science, but all of my previous experience has been in education and teaching, even while I was in undergrad. And mostly it's within uh, scientific inquiry, um, STEM, those type of topics. And I was involved in the educational arcade with those topics. Um, well, life kind of took me all the way to Taiwan and I realized that I couldn't actually conduct experiments in scientific inquiry because I don't write in Chinese. And so, <laughs> so I ended up switching focus to English as a second language because I could actually conduct experiments on that. <laughs> so then I had to relearn and uh, learn a lot about uh, linguistics, language acquisition, which is all really interesting topics. And during that time period, that's when the idea of elementary kind of formed because I was in a class called uh, digital, digital eBooks, I believe it was. We were using InDesign at that time and I found InDesign to be very frustrating, complicated and um, impossible to share, which is kind of counterintuitive of what education should be, which I believe should be open to everyone 
and uh, allowing basically anyone to be able to learn. I come from MIT, so whole MOOCs and uh, open courseware is really ingrained into me along with open source uh, material. So that's kind of my background. Mm -hmm. So after I actually quit my master's program to start developing elementary, um, at that time, the idea was just uh, we want to create an authoring tool. So um, my, like I said, my background is not in development of any digital tools prior. I was a teacher. I was a management person. I knew nothing about coding. I didn't really know anything about website development. I knew none of that. Um, but uh, we decided to learn it. <laughs> and so over time, we built the website from scratch. I started with a Django for Girls tutorial to build the website, <laughs> which is a great tutorial. <laughs> if, you, if you're teaching coding to any uh, small children, it's a great mm -hmm. tutorial. Um, and from there, we built the website, built the, the idea up. Because when you go to people and you tell them about your idea, then they're going to come up to you and be like, OK, let me know when it's done and uh, look at you like you're kind of crazy. And, Unfortunately, that was the feeling that I got while I was in my undergrad. So I decided to uh, just take things into my own hands and just try to build it myself. Uh, thankfully, I had a really, I have a really great partner, David. So he has been mostly working on the actual authoring tool portion itself. And while I have been working more on the entire packaging, the back end, mostly in the website development. Okay. And so elementary is an online platform where anyone, especially kids, can be able to create and share interactive stories. And these are stories that can have audio, they can have music, they can even end differently. And there's just so many possibilities on digital that is just not possible with a traditional format. And finally, we have over 8,000 now illustrations and sounds that you can use to jumpstart your story on elementary. Very cool. And so and you, you approached this initially from the standpoint of being uh, an ESL teacher? Yes. So just from a teacher perspective, because I wanted a tool that would actually be interactive. Yeah. To but, have um, interactive content. And but what I'm finding so far in my exploring of elementary is it's so much more than just an, just an ESL yes. tool. Yes. Yes. My background was originally yeah. in engineering, so that's also the reason why that um, elementary has such a huge component that is based upon um, computational thinking mm -hmm. and trying to introduce coding concepts in a way that is not code to students who might not want to, you know, learn how to code. <laughs> that's wonderful. The idea really... Uh, it was always originally creating interactive stories. That has always been core, but we did take some turns because what we realized was you need assets to create cool stories. And if you don't, if you're not an illustrator, then it's kind of difficult to create engaging content, unfortunately. So, so that actually brings up um, an interesting question on my part that I was curious about with um, with what you're doing with elementary mentor elementary um, is one of the things you, you're 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 talking about how how big you are an open and open source. Um, mm -hmm. so, so how do you work that out with the artists whose illustrations and and things? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. So one thing. I found, um, so I've been crawling through uh, some of the Facebook groups for children's book writers and illustrators. And I realized that you have so much illustrators out there that are just so talented. And unfortunately, like the only thing they could do is post their, their character on Twitter or on Facebook and then get a like on it. And that's the end of it. Um, so what we hope to do is have our platform be a way that they can market themselves and also understand how their characters or artwork is being used and just know which ones are popular um, and just have a, a interesting way to show off their portfolio because you could be like oh i have you know x amount of illustrations on elementary and out of these illustrations i've had i don't know 100 stories created using this character or something like that. And it's just kind of nice to know that people really appreciate your work in a way that's not just a like or a like a comment, something that's kind of inconsequential, 
when you want to think about a, a creative process. Mm -hmm. um is there have... some sort of goal or or way that you're hoping to to like because obviously the artists have to somehow feed themselves as well right yes 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 so we are looking to profit share with our artists um obviously we have to feed ourselves first but, uh, and the platform because there are costs to running things mm -hmm. but our our main goal is in the end we hope to be able to profit share like a good percentage up to 70 is what we aim for but of course right now we're not making any money so <laughs> so uh it's a dream right now and we have really wonderful contributors who are just helping us all along the way like um one of our artists is uh, len smith and he's a prior disney uh illustrator actually he created toontown in okay. who framed roger rabbit i was like what <laughs> experience than I have years in my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's like made all sorts of designs for of course like Disney as well as like corporate like mascots and stuff. It's just mind-blowing that he's actually um he's helping us so much. He's always asking me, oh what do you need next? What kind of character should I do next? And helping us how did you hook him into the project to show him of uh, of it being initially like, you know, open source as far as using his his artwork. Mm -hmm. It's actually very interesting what happened because I, at the beginning we thought, oh, it would only be, you know, um, uh, young artists who are just starting out. They would be our target who would, uh, you know, contribute to the platform. We thought those would be the people that would be willing to have their artwork put on the platform because of course, all stories that are published do credit automatically and notify automatically the artist mm -hmm. whose work has been used. That is built into the system. But it's still like, would you be willing to have your work used, obviously? Do you give that permission? And what was really funny was uh, we found that all the young people that we contacted um, from like DeviantArt or from schools, art schools, they weren't actually interested. And what we did find who were interested were all the professionals mm -hmm. um, with tons of experience, like Len Smith, we have another one. Um, Richard Walsh, he also has worked, uh, I don't know for which big media company, but a very large one, but he was actually the illustrator for, I think, Math Blaster, Reading Blaster series. So that was pretty cool. I was like, I, I played those games when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was like seven, <laughs> taught me how to read. <laughs> That's awesome. And um, had like, you know, just children's illustrators and things like that. And I think what really struck me was um, they realized that, uh, first of all, they really just loved the initiative of being able to have their artwork used by kids everywhere to create stories. But also they... Um, they believe that it's a good way to also like promote themselves. And also, um, finally, we have the idea of in the end, we want a profit share. So they also see that as a future that is possible. Nice, nice. And I imagine there's sort of an aspect too that's probably when they've hit a certain level in their career too, that's kind of a giving back sort of thing. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that's also part of it as well. So, um, so yeah. the team's made up of yourself and your partner. So it's David. made up of me and my partner David. Yes. Yeah. And so, and and you take care of you're taking care of the coding and the platform building aspect. So we take care of literally everything from okay. the coding, the development, the translation, <laughs> the marketing, the curriculum development as well. Um, we kind of do everything <laughs> right so now. This really has been a almost a master's project unto itself for you. <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, yeah. One of the things that I'm I'm curious to um, to ask you about is um, you've been talking all about open, and yes. so um, and and I you know in my sort of I was ga gathering that there was definitely that aspect as I was exploring um, elementary so. Can you just sort of let us know, uh, tell us about which aspects are free to access and use, mm -hmm. which access, if you've got open um, educational resources in there that users can adapt, um, mm -hmm. and then um, are there restricted access and pay to play access or like aspects to the whole thing? Yes. And then I guess so, you made the decisions you made mm -hmm. for 
each of those. So uh, elementary is free for anyone to create stories. We have a premium component, which is uh, the entire bank of illustrations and sounds. Um, we have about 2000 that are just free for everyone to use. You can publish it and then you're good to go. We also have a free tier for teachers because I understand teachers are always looking for new ways to engage their students, especially in a digital context. And for those we have um, the free tier has one classroom up to 30 students. You can add the students without needing an email. We are the COPA FERPA compliant. We don't have any student data, all that jazz. And uh, basically, we just want teachers to be able to use it to have engage their students to create stories. That's the whole main goal. We don't want to put a barrier for anyone to create. We want to have you know the disadvantaged kid to still be able to make their dino story into reality. Um, that's one of our main goals. So of course we have a premium plan. We have a premium plan for individuals. So this might be the kid who, I don't know, just wants to create a story or a professional writer who's like, oh, I want to use this to kind of prototype and try out new ideas and get it out to an audience. It doesn't really matter. It's a individual plan. Uh, the teacher plan is up to 90 students and all your student accounts have access to all the premium features. So all the the entire library of illustrations is open to all your students up to 90. And then we're also now working on a school plan, which is basically unlimited classrooms, unlimited, unlimited teachers, unlimited students, and it's just a one set price. And so it's easy for you to calculate and uh, we just want to get you on board that way. So nice. that's pretty much what our pricing plan is at this point. Just just to clarify there, um, do you do you have any open um, access? Oh, like open resources yeah, sorry. So the platform. So all of our educational resources are public. Yeah. Um, we are now working with some schools uh, to do case studies with them on mm -hmm. their learning context. Yeah. So for example, we're th this is all in discussion, but we're in discussion with a couple of libraries who might be interested and using elementary from coding to writing. We're also in discussion with uh, public schools um, for writing purposes or for uh, language learning purposes. We're also discussing with, you know, private uh, language institutions as well. So, and then also just the individual tutor that has like a projector with however many students. So yeah. we're trying to look at different learning contexts, create a case study of it. We're working with them to create curriculum that fits into their situation the end goal of this curriculum is to have a finished product that they can showcase in their classroom library um, and all of those resources will be made public and available so what i mean by public is you are free to modify this um, okay. curriculum for your own personal yeah. use because i don't see what's the purpose of having a curriculum if you cannot modify it for your yeah. own end use that doesn't make sense to me so me either so it means uh, we want you to <coughs> modify it, preferably also let us know what your modifications are and how they, <coughs> sorry, and how they work. And uh, also we're looking at the community for translation. So that's also another way to modify. And finally, elementary um, has for all its stories, they're remixable. So that's another portion that is kind of uh, the adaptation. So for example, if I create a lesson on, I don't know, animal adaptations, and I put it on elementary, you can take my exact project and remix it. This remix will copy this project to your studio. You can edit it, translate it, do whatever you want to it, make it into a wacky story. I don't really care. You publish it and it will automatically contribute me as the original author source. Okay. So right. we also have that sort of contributing that is um, built into the system. Yeah, 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 very cool. Yeah, and your your viewpoints as far as um, the lesson planning side are, is the exact same as um, my sort of partner in crime, uh, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know why as a teacher, it just seems natural to teaching, right? So, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know your students better than me. That's what I always exactly. tell all teachers I talk to. I'm like, you know them better than me. You are the teacher, not me. I can just give you ideas on how I would maybe implement it into your classroom mm -hmm. but the actual ex execution is up to you i'm not going to be there so you'll probably know what works best for your class 
if your yeah. class, I don't know, likes to maybe uh, talk a lot, maybe your story should be more audiobook centric. If your class is, um, I don't know, having difficulties in some other aspect, you'll know and I won't know. So I won't know what to focus on. Yeah. And that's what's being a teacher is. Otherwise, why would you need teachers? You just have robots do everything. <laughs> exactly. You're, you're, one exactly. of my goals right now is, is marketing everything, but I'm also gathering that probably goes part and parcel with, with building up the financial, like, you know, the yes. financial model behind yes. your project. Mm -hmm. What, um, when you first started this, did, did you have sort of some grant money? Did you just invest your own blood, sweat and tears? Like, like blood, how? Blood, sweat and tears. <laughs> So we actually went the route of, at the very beginning, I tried the route of pitching mm -hmm. to try to get investors maybe interested in um, the platform and all of that. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't go so well. And I realized that if I wanted things done, I should just hunker down and just do it and build it. Because the amount of time that you spend trying to pitch and trying to sell takes away from any time that you might do in actually developing your project. So it's a, a weighing of what you think would actually be more most beneficial. Um, and unfortunately, education is not a sexy industry in, uh, in the investment sphere. Um, first of all, at least in the areas that I was pitching and maybe if I were to pitch in, I don't know, in the US, it might be different. I don't know. I never tried pitching in the US. I mostly pitched in uh, Taiwan and I also pitched in France mm -hmm. and unfortunately in those those times that I pitched the people I were pitching to were not were very disconnected from the problems that I was saying that were existing for example they're like oh what's the point of creating stories who reads stories who wants to write stories uh, <laughs> no I'm serious this was a, this was a question that they asked then the second thing would be um if you only need 100,000, then uh, since you went to MIT, why don't you just ask your friends and family to pitch in and pay for it? Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, there were there were just clues like that that yeah. uh, led me to think that maybe we were not in the same world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we decided to no longer spend time trying to chase after those type of people and just work on trying to build a good product because we believe if we build a good product, people will just use it. And then once you make something good and people like it, then people will automatically be your salespeople and tell other people about it. So our main goal is just to make the best product that we can that can fulfill the needs of uh, our uh, target audience. Uh, from that initial step, what are your like sort of your next funding model sort of building yes. blocks in there? So we are right now talking to certain associations to host writing workshops or just workshops using elementary. So in those cases, we'd be kind of like a consultant. We would go in, we would run the project and we would get paid a certain amount of money that would cons constitute as running those events. So we'll be doing some of those to uh, help with uh, part of um, the funding. Um, and the second thing would just be trying to pitch our premium plan that is finally out <laughs> so people can actually begin to pay if they're interested in it. So on that side, we are first working with uh, a couple uh, partners. And during the partnership program, they'll have access to all the features and we'll work with them to create the curriculum. And once the partnership ends and the curriculum is already completed and executed and done, then they can choose whether or not to sign up for um, a premium plan. And in that case, we'll get a discount for them because they helped us. But mm -hmm. so those are kind of like the two, uh, the main two ways that we're uh, approaching it right now. Yeah. And of course you just have, a, you know, if people sign up and pay, then that's great, you know? <laughs> Um, with Lori and I, we 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 do um, we're big in building educational things too. But usually it's around documentary storytelling projects and web series mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So I know one of our big struggles um, has been um, 
setting up that uh, sustainable funding model. And so, so where within your, your plan are you seeing like, you know, the sustainable things, like what, what's kind of more one off to allow you to sort of jump to this next level and where is sort of that more long-term sustainable? So the sustainable thing would be um, teacher premium plans and school premium plans, most likely is where we would get our sustainable funding from. Once we have, you know, the good case studies, curriculum units that are publicly available, uh, those type of things will allow teachers and schools to kind of make the jump to say, okay, I want to implement this as part of our X unit of uh, whatever we're learning. And that way we can, you know, have a sustainable income coming in either every month or every year, depending on what they subscribe to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And do you have okay. any sort of future strategies that you haven't um, sort of put in play yet, but have been kind of sort of just bouncing around in your brain like, oh, I wonder if we try this? Uh, for future marketing strategies or yeah. just... Uh, yeah. Or future so, marketing or future, um, you know, uh, financing as well? Mm hmm I mean, obviously the ideal situation would be, you know, we get like funding from the like government or something and then we could just run it <laughs> but, uh, we could become like you know one of those things that get some grant money and be happy um no right now i think we're just focusing on subscription model because that seems to work out with uh, a lot of companies and as long as you can make a product that people want to use consistently make it uh you know affordable enough yet competitive mm -hmm. um in terms of features then um, I think we can find success in that way. And it's it's smart to like, you know, you're starting to see, you know, to focus on one thing at a time so that you're yeah. not, you know, getting pulled in too many different directions. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Do you have uh, other strategies, like, you know, whether it's marketing or things like that to help with the achieve success with the project? Well, um, I think the main thing would be to just, like I mentioned before, working with the schools to create a good examples of what a good classroom library will look like, because that mm -hmm. kind of markets itself. You, yeah. You're a teacher and you have like, you know, let's say you have 30 students, you have 30 projects within your classroom library. Then you can go up to your principal and be like, hey, look at what my students made. They're so awesome. They have voiceovers and animation and different mm -hmm. endings. Mm -hmm. It'd be so cool if we could implement this in the school. What we need is we need to go from a bottom up approach um, yep. rather than a top down approach, because um, from my experience, when I went from two administrators, they'd be like, oh, you know, we have curriculum that is uh, very intense and rigorous and we don't have time to implement any of these things. Or they just don't reply to your emails because you're not part of their network. So <laughs> that's the other thing that happens. Yeah. And unfortunately, I don't come from the sphere of teachers or administrators, so I can't go and pull those type of connections that maybe, you know, someone who worked at Pearson might be able to do more easily. Um, so we just have to go from a, you know, grassroots approach. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a smart approach, um, especially if they then like end up sharing it with their the family, mm -hmm. parents and things exactly. like that. And it's really great because um, like when I was a teacher, the big thing, I was mostly a teacher for um, programs. So these are programs that, you know, parents pay to send their kids to go to, to, you know, learn something. And what parents want is they want to see a product at the end of this program that is the accumulation of all the things that their child has learned. So they feel like their money is kind of well spent. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and that's why project-based learning is so great because you have a product at the end of it to show parents and be like, you see, I wasn't just taking your money and like, sending your kids in a corner to watch Netflix or something. <laughs> they actually learn something. So what we really want to do is really emphasize that end product and we want to be able to share that. So, oh, I forgot one of our major marketing strategy, strategies that is uh, currently ongoing um, is we are embeddable. So that means any story that you create, you can put it on your blog, you can put it on your personal website, those type of things to showcase it. And what we're working on now is to make it so you can embed it directly into like, for example, Medium. 
So if you write a Medium post, you can have your interactive story in Medium, or you can have your interactive story directly in, I don't know, Reddit or things like that. So we're mm -hmm. working towards that. And I mean, ideally in the future, you can, you know, read your interactive story within your Facebook wall and you don't have to go to the website to read the story. So that'd be really cool. Yeah. So do you want to do you want to tell me about the um the thing that you've just started implementing the last few days with your project? So the last few days have basically been me talking to teachers who are interested from a Facebook post that I posted in a couple groups. I was like, are you interested in elementary? And what we found was like incredible responses and also people that are willing to partner with us on a longer time scale who are interested in actually promoting us to their home countries or to their um, school boards or things like that. And so in these cases, we're looking at uh, potentially an ambassador program, which means that uh, they will become an ambassador of elementary. And if they make a, a sale, let's say, or if they get a school to sign up and upgrade their account, they can put in, you know, their ambassador code. We give them a certain commission percentage and then uh, people will be happy, we'll be happy, and then we can have everyone <laughs> be happy. <laughs> That's smart. Um, very because smart. I'm only one person, so I can't do sales for everyone. And uh, and it's really great. And it wasn't actually, it was actually uh, suggested by one of the teachers themselves, like, oh, I have two months break during, um, during summer because I run a language institution. And I know a lot of the public school teachers in my country uh, what if I get some conferences with them or what if I present elementary to those to those teachers or to the conference uh, for education? I'm like, that sounds amazing. <laughs> How am I going to say no to that? <laughs> yeah, no, that's fantastic. <laughs> so that's a potential way that we will also get uh, more users on board is through this sort of uh, ambassadorship program. Uh, and the uh, final thing is uh, for the analytics, or do you want to ask a question about that? No. <laughs> Just so you can jump in and tell me about the analytics. Okay, so elementary does have analytics. They are just not public yet because we have not created a nice looking dashboard for it. But we aim to have these analytic features available for either um, potentially school signups that get on board so they can see uh, how, how their students create stories and kind of also how readers interact with their students' stories. Um, but mostly as a professional writer, or just someone who's interested in knowing how their stories go, uh, we'd have an individual plan that will be adding these analytic features on. So for example, you are a children's book writer and you want to test out some new ideas and you want to see how these ideas work, how long people stay on your book. Well, you can do that with elementary. You write your story, you just hit publish and we provide all the analytics for you from how long you spend on a page, where do readers uh, stop reading, what do they click on, if it's interactive, if you make a choose your own adventure book, maybe what path do most people choose? Um, if you're a teacher, maybe what choice do people choose for a quiz? Those are some sort of things that we are trying to implement and those will be for a uh, upper tier uh, premium plan. And on top of that, if you're a professional writer, you probably won't want your stories to be remixable maybe because you might want to, I don't know, teach a very specific topic about health and you don't want people to mess it up. <laughs> or maybe you just don't want people to use your story in, in a different way. So for that, we're also adding options for, uh, for those will be all premium features. We haven't exactly implemented those yet, but those are all in the, in the roadway of what's coming forward in the future, so. <laughs> very, very cool. Yeah, of course we also have other features we wanna do, but uh, those are also in the future. Like uh, for example, our real end goal would be, what would be really cool with interactive stories is if you as a reader can choose what your character will be. So I'm a reader, I'm like, I wanna be a girl. I wanna have, I don't know, pink hair. I want uh, to have, you know, to wear purple, those type of things and kind of choose your avatar and you can go through the story that way. And as a writer, what we want to do, what we want to help writers do is to make that entire process easy. So you don't have to code anything really. You can just kind of drop a character on the page and then that will be like a special character that people can kind of customize. 
That's very cool. Yeah, one yeah. of the things I've been kind of just interested in, in watching recently is just um, that, well, it's been making me really happy to see that there is a movement towards having more diverse characters out there mm -hmm. in different stories. So that, uh, and I, I don't know why for the longest time people thought that, no, it has to be like, you know, very you know, Anglo-Saxon and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I, as a kid, I loved learning about different cultures. And mm -hmm. so I don't know why we went through these decades where it was just these very specific characters because people are only going to, yeah, anyhow. It, uh... Well, I think the main thing is uh, publishing before was very top down heavy, which meant uh, whatever the publisher thought would be selling would be what mm -hmm. they would choose to publish. Whereas now, um, well, first of all, you have a political climate change, which is now diversity, diversity, diversity. So publishers from top obviously now have a agenda to push forward diverse characters and diverse stories and those type of things because they're actually selling and it's moving forward with the, the political climate nowadays. And on top of that, you have independents who are just coming up and writing whatever stories they want, publishing it however they want. And uh, if it takes off, then it takes off. Yeah. It's one of the beauties I've found about the digital space is it's, it's making it easier for people to start and build without that top-down approval. Yeah, definitely. You have like, um, I've seen a lot of people have really great success um, through the Kickstarters, mm -hmm. like to kickstart their children's book. Um, I've basically been lurking through uh, the children's illustrator and writers uh, group. Yeah. I see a lot of uh, really amazing success stories from independents that, uh, that basically, you know, they have, they started out with a regular job and they're like, well, my passion was always to write children's books they get their uh, however much money they need to commission the artwork or they try to find an artist who's willing to work with them for a, you know a percentage royalty split um and then they just go forward and publish and you see a lot of support for independence coming from like uh you have uh for the example in the children's book writers associate uh facebook group you have also one guy who is helping with getting orders of books in china so you you can cut down your costs as much as possible and just order directly from uh, you know a Chinese factory that uh, does printing, for example, rather than using um, Amazon Create Space or those type of things that might have a higher uh, cost. Yeah. So. Yeah. Very cool. And I was like, wow, that's really impressive. And uh, yeah. some of them have done really amazing things. I'm like, wow. <laughs> oh, it's an exciting world out there. I just need the energy to move forward at all of it. As far as yeah, what yeah. have you learned from this whole journey you've been on that, you know, that you might carry with you on to future projects? Uh, yeah, being an entrepreneur sounds cool, but uh, it's actually not that cool. <laughs> um, like my family, uh, my family comes from a line of, you know, entrepreneurs, but never digital. So they always wonder like, why are you doing this? And they don't understand that you can do things on the internet. So that's also a challenge that I have to face um, because they have a more traditional business. My mom runs, uh, uh, she does real estate. Um, she basically buys really old property. She spruces them up and then she rents them out. And my father, he runs a Taekwondo studio. So he has like a whole bunch of chains of people who teach Taekwondo and for them, they run their own business. So they understand like the values of being your own business, but they don't really understand like what the internet is all about. And they don't understand that uh, they're like, oh, if you like education, why don't you just be a teacher then? Or you can teach at the Taekwondo studio and like run your own academy or something like that. Yeah. And I mean, that's a completely feasible option. I could do that really easily. I can just go over there. We have the space, we have the resources. I can open up a school if I wanted to, and it would be no problem almost. Um, but the thing is like with digital, you have so much more opportunities. You can really affect not just, you know, your 100 students in front of you, but like it can be a tool to really impact uh, students all over the world, thousands like, and make them actually like writing maybe and make them actually like 
doing things that are not just, you know, watching Netflix or uh, being passive because the, the end goal is to really engage students to be active in their learning and not to just watch a video, fill out a, you know, a quiz with a multiple choice and then submitting it and saying, oh, I learned something. Our, our end goal is to really have students become participants into um, a more this connected world that we have and feel like they're you know being part of a community because when you create a story you publish a story all of a sudden your story is not your story your story is the accumulation of maybe 10 artists five musicians and you're like the director of the entire project and uh, being part of that is like what we really want to focus on and I think the hardest thing about being an entrepreneur is like too often you go down the wrong road because you think something something seems good at that time and you develop it and you develop it and then you realize oh no <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have done that and you have to you have to make a turn and maybe just scrap everything that you've done and at that point it's really really challenging to really you know bring yourself up and be like okay should I continue doing this and you know always have to find something to tell other people like oh yeah i'm doing my project that i've been you know doing for the past two years that hasn't really done anything or should i just you know go find a job make money go on vacations and you know be able to go out to eat <laughs> so it's like very new dane things like that that's like really challenging about being an entrepreneur i feel and the things that i've learned is uh, yeah sometimes even when it's hard, it's it's really a choice of you have to really make a decision about what your core values are and what you really prioritize. And that's really hard because too often we want everything in the world. And unfortunately, that's impossible. You can't have everything in the world. You're not you don't have that opportunity to have everything. You have to make difficult choices. And um, yeah, I think for me, it's uh, learning that you have to make difficult choices. Sometimes it's OK to screw up and you will screw up because if you don't screw up, I, I don't know, you must be God or something. <laughs> well, I also think through from the mistakes, that's where we have our biggest learning like curve. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Like I told you, um, we didn't know anything about coding when we first started. So you could imagine the types of twists and turns we did before we have our website as it is today. Yeah. Um, and uh, things like, you know, technology changes so fast. So, for example, at the beginning of when we were building the website, uh, we, like the technology that we're using now didn't even really exist back then. So <laughs> to learn, um, to learn really quickly is also something that we have to pick up on and be able to, you know, iterate and just just try to improve every time. So yeah. I don't know. <laughs> That's just a. You should be incredibly proud of yourself for what you've been creating, because. Uh, well, thank you. It's uh, it's well, it's an amazing. I mean, it's I got really excited when I saw what you're building, but then I also like. There's the other part of me as I listen to your story too, and it's just <laughs> it's it's an awesome and it's an inspiring story. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's it's kind of difficult for me because like uh, I always like to compare myself to like my mother, for example, and um, <laughs> it's really it's really hard for me <laughs> as like an individual to always be like, yeah, maybe I'm just not good enough <laughs> or something. You're yeah. you are you are more than good enough. You're amazing. And